Hello, hello everyone. I think that we are all here today for this uh, third and final installment of the um, conversational series we've been having this year, Curating in Conversation. And I want to uh, say thank you very much to the Simpson Center who has been funding this and to um, Bridget Johnson who has coordinated so much of this. Um, and I also wanna start by acknowledging all um, that the Burke Museum stands on the lands of the Coast Salish people whose ancestors have resided here since time immemorial. Many indigenous people thrive in this place, alive and strong. And I wanna acknowledge as well, all the communities whose cultural heritage is so far from their traditional territories and to whom we are responsible for their care. So, um, and I also want to thank very much Ryan Federson and Miranda Bellardi Lewis for joining us tonight on this sort of beautiful spring evening at my house. It's uh, sunny, although it's been raining and sunny on and off all day long. Um, and so what we're gonna do tonight is we have a question and answer um, form, which you all can fill out at any time. And we'll get to those questions a little bit further along uh, in our conversation. And I'm going to introduce both of our speakers Ryan's going to share some images with us, and Miranda will tell us a little about her curatorial experience, and then we'll just move into a conversation. Um, so I'll start by um, introducing Miranda, and then uh, we'll move from there. So Miranda Bellardi Lewis uh, is an assistant professor of North American Indigenous Knowledge at the Information School at the University of Washington. She is also an independent curator and Indigenous knowledge systems are central to her work. She examines the role of social media and arts in protecting and documenting and per perpetuating Native information. She's worked on um, many exhibitions at the Fry Art Museum um, and also at the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, particularly recently the um, Raven in the Box of Daylight show with Preston Singletary, which was quite a sensational installation. And I hope that Miranda, you'll tell us a little bit more about that too. Um, and I wondered if you wanted to say just a few words to introduce yourself. I don't want to speak for you and then we'll move on to Ryan. Good evening, Kitty. Good evening, Ryan. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it is a, it's a pleasure to be here, um, here on Coast Salish Territories, um, Zuni and Clinkett. And so as a uninvited guests here in the Puget Sound area, it is, always just such a blessing to be able to live in such a beautiful place and raise my family and do my work. And um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. You know, I've been um, a big fan of the Feddersons, um, the different family members who will create art. And it's been really phenomenal to witness um, Ryan's artistic and curatorial work really blossom in the last few years. And so I'm really excited uh, to see where our conversation goes today. Um, my research is, you know, like Katie said about native art, um, focus on native art, but really looking at how native um, information and knowledge is transferred via native art. And so how that comes into my curatorial work, I'll talk about later, but um, I'm just really excited to be here today. So thank you for the invitation. Of course. and I I realized that I did not introduce myself. And so for those of you uh, who don't know, I'm Katie von Marcuse, and I'm the curator of Northwest Native Art at the Burke Museum and assistant professor of Native Art in the Art History Division in the School of Art. And I'm a non-Native settler scholar who works here in Coast Salish territory. Um, and so I'll, I'd like to introduce Ryan and thank you so much for being here. Ryan Federson specializes in creating interactive murals site-specific installation and immersive public artworks that invite audience engagement. Uh, she received her BFA at Cornish College of the Arts in 2009. She's an enrolled member of the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation from the Pumagaro Lakes Band. She's recently received a national fellowship from the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, and she has a number of public artwork um, including the large mural for the Burke, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, and a recent piece for the University of Washington's uh, public health building called Antecedents, which I find uh, really captivating. Uh, and her work 
has been all through Washington State and across North America. She's worked with Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, for Culture, many of the museums in the region, um, and also across the East Coast uh, and Midwest as well. And so Ryan, thank you so much for being here today and um, sharing a little bit more with us about your practice. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you tonight and with Miranda, of whom I am also a very big fan. Um, thank you so much for your kind words. Um, I will mention that beyond the Feddersons, there's a, uh, a very creative family. I'm also um, cousins with the Alex, which are designers, writers, and painters, and tattoo artists as well, uh, and Passmore's in glass making. Um, creativity is a big part of my family's life and tradition. And I'm very excited to carry that on. Um, and so I'm coming to you from uh, Tacoma. Um, my tribes of the interior Salish and I'm over here on Coast Salish territory, specifically the uh, homelands and con current lands of the Puyallup. Um, and should I start the presentation next? And I'll just jump right into a quick introduction. I'll try and be quick. I'm not, um, I don't time myself, so I will do my best. Um, but just a quick introduction to a couple of my projects as well as some of my uh, projects as a artist curator. And so my, my work centers a lot on looking for opportunities for introspection and uh, critical thinking around our um, social constructs. And I approach it from a lens of looking at um, both perspectives from my indigenous heritage, but also perspectives from my white settler heritage and the kind of intersection of those um, cultures through time and currently as well. And so a lot of my work is kind of these amalgamations of different types of cultural references with the purpose of talking through problems. Problem solving is a, is a big part of the work that I do. And so I'm gonna talk about a couple different projects a quick introduction. And so this first project is 900 Horses. It's from 2015. It's um, my first um, commissioned um, public artwork. Um, I was at the, before this point was working a lot in interactive projects that had been primarily in uh, museums or sometimes in uh, park or other public settings or events. And this piece was commissioned by Spokane Arts for the Tribal Gathering Place in Spokane, Washington. It was a 14 day uh, temporary, per, temporary mural that was a community enacted memorial to 900 horses that were slaughtered by the US military in 1858. And so the piece was about talking through this history and specifically thinking about it as a access point to invite people to think a little bit differently about their relationship to the Indian Wars. And so while the piece was looking at a war crime that involved these horses, which were stolen by the military from the Palouse, Coeur d'Alene and Spokane, um, and then brutally slaughtered over four days and killing almost 900 or almost a thousand animals in four days is a horrific, horrific feat. Um, but I wanted to think about the, each individual of those lives and invite the public to create an effigy to, dedicate their creative energy to uh, memorializing one of these these animals. And I, I chose looking at the, at the horses for the Indian Wars as a way for people to, for everyone to have an access point. And it might be a little bit simple, but I thought um, we all as humans share a love for other animals. And so recognizing this atrocity was a new way to think about um, in, encounters in this region. And so over the course of these, um, I think I said 14 days really, that was a different project. This was nine days. Over the course of these nine days, um, you can see me and my sister is helping me uh, create um, nearly a thousand reverse prints of these horses and the public um, each, there was one person, one horse, they would uh, illustrate the design. Um, and then I've been working more towards public art, um, especially lately I've been dedicating most of my creative energy towards public art. And this was a piece called Antecedents and it was commissioned by the Washington State Arts Commission in partnership with the University of Washington for the Utah Population Health Building, which at this point is not quite open yet. 
um, due to the pandemic, but it is open to those who work there. So in this piece, the um, audience is a variety of scientists and students who are working towards the, the problems presented in populations health, specifically in the inequity between how long you live based on how rich you are, the color of your skin and where you live. And it's kind of looking at those problems of making um, access for everyone to have a thriving uh, life and health. Um, and so this made me of course think about the other people, which are the animal people, the bird people, fish, the, the plant people, and how we as humans cannot think about as, ourselves as separate. And I wanted to provide like a space, somewhat of a welcome and vision setting. So this is at the pedestrian entrance and it's loosely based on um, four food chief stories that are uh, told in the Okanagan Kettle Falls and uh, interior Salish region. And the idea is that before, before there were people, two-legged people, us, there were um, the people of the animal people, the four-legged people, the people of the sky, the people of the water, and the people of the land, and that each one had everything they needed to survive in order and, and thrive. However, when humanity was introduced, we were just this naked infant that was unable to survive on its own. And so each, each chief from each pillar of life gave a gift in order to help humanity survive. So in this piece, each one of those pillars is recognized as well as humanity represented by the cradle board, um, which is intended to represent us as the infants. And it's a reminder that we are not the first in the order of life, but we are the last. And that our health and survival depends on the health of every other life form that we share the world with. And so I wanted this piece to present all on this equal scale, which is why there's kind of monumental pieces where the camas root is just as big as the bear and the baby is just as big as the feather. Um, and they're all in light boxes to reference um, diagnos diagnostic processes and represented as x-rays to also look to the language of um, medicine and diagnosis paired with this idea of um, equality of, all, of life forms. And here is another angle that gets you a better look at the um, cradle board. It's really hard to photograph something that's lit up, so I wish you could see the beautiful translucent beadwork, etc. But you guys are on the campus, some of you, so you'll be able to have a look at some point. Um, and next, I'm going to talk about a couple of my um, curatorial projects. Um, the first is In Red Ink, which was for the Museum of Northwest Art in LaConnor in 2018. This exhibition was part of the E.S. Curtis uh, exhibitions that happened throughout the coast. Um, these exhibitions were um, looking at kind of the history of the um, pseudo-ethnographic portraiture of Native Americans, which was much more towards a social Darwinist project um, always ask who's paying for it, funded by uh, JP Morgan and Roosevelt um, to show Native people as being incompatible with modern technology and modern life. And so then these images are being kind of like rebroadcast out once again as historical documents. And I was invited to make a show that was a, a response to these exhibitions. And it, in red ink is this idea of a corrective lens where instead of portraits of native people by white photographers, it's um, all native artists talking about their own experiences, um, showing people from a wide variety of regions and perspectives, using materials in all kinds of different ways and um, giving everyone the opportunity to s speak with their, their own voice. And I also thought of it as a little bit of a bait and switch because people are going to come as part of this E.S. Curtis and expect these very romantic historic images and then they're presented with very contemporary work. Um, so I was ex excited to kind of broaden some horizons through that pairing. Um, and that was the first uh, exhibition that I curated with um, 20 artists from throughout, the, uh, throughout America and Canada, but focusing mostly on the Pacific Northwest. Um, this next exhibition, Not Fragile, in 2018, was created for the Contemporary uh, Center for Contemporary Native Art in Portland, the Portland Art Museum. 
And the exhibition was using glass as a metaphor to talk about um, strength, re resiliency, vulnerability, as well as um, transformation. And so it's um, all artists who are using glass in a variety of different ways. Most artists also have a social practice. So I wanted to look at artists who are not just making art in a specific medium, but who are using that medium to tell stories um, and specifically to, um, to deepen an understanding. And so there's artists who have a lot of work in glass and there's other artists who don't have any other pieces in glass, um, as well as like the spectacular um, beaded uh, lawn chair, which was a replica of the artist's grandmother's uh, powwow chair. Um, and so that is not fragile. And the last piece I'm gonna talk about, or the project I'm gonna talk about, which I'm really excited for, I just completed, is a permanent collection for Kamiak Elementary School. And this was commissioned by the Washington State Arts Commission for a elementary school in Pullman, Washington. Why I'm so excited about this project is because it is a purchase collection. And so I got to select artists from, from which to collect for the state. And I um, tried and succeeded in, per, in, in finding artists who were not in the current collection. So all of these artists were additions to the collection. Um, and as in all of the exhibitions I've done, um, there are emerging artists who some, some of these artists are very early in their career. Um, other artists who are est established artists. Um, so we're looking at a piece by uh, Rowan Morgu, which is a kind of this explosion of um, of uh, Salmon Row, which is the, the opening space to the school, um, the wonderful Sarah Seastrom, and this nine by 12 foot uh, reinstallation of a photographic work that she had previously produced that, that was unfortunately destroyed and that we reproduced in uh, aluminum. Uh, Kaia Farrell Smith's beautiful painting referencing um, the uh, pictographs that are so common in this area on. Um, uh, sorry, st uh, stone features, um, as well as work with uh, Kara Romero and um, Natalie Ball. And so this school is named after a chief who was, um, who gathered together a group of other uh, chiefs and soldiers, or not soldiers, but like warriors throughout that, the region to fight, um, fight uh, settlers. And he banded a bunch of really disparate tribes together and it was an impressive group of people and movement against this um, invasion. But what, was, what I also found really interesting about it is that the, the reason he was able to do it is because he had five wives who had all these family connections with other tribes, um, as well as one of the most renowned uh, medicine women and um, warrior women in the region also like fighting by his side. Um, so this piece, uh, recognizes um, that story by selecting all women and non-binary native artists from uh, this region to collect, to bring their work together. And with that, we'll hand it back. Hopefully I was good on time. I think that was wonderful. I really appreciate um, hearing all of the things that inspire you from your really interactive public art pieces and then how you're bringing in new and emerging artists um, and people who have not had access to being in those purchased state collections before. And I think it's a wonderful segue to hearing about some of the things that are inspirational to Miranda in her curatorial work. So I'll turn it over to you, Miranda. Thank you for showing all of that, Ryan. It's really, really great to see um, your work and the curatorial practice, and I'll come back to a question I have just because I have questions <laughs> about that later. But um, as uh, I don't have any images today, I, I'm just going to um, tell you about some of the projects that I've worked on. Uh, Katie mentioned that I um, have done some exhibition work for the Fry um, here in Seattle. There, um, I curated uh, Stormy Weber's uh, Casino of Palimpsest, as well as Alice 
Alison uh, Bremner at the time, um, her name was Alison Marks. And so if you look up Alison Marks, one gray hair, that's where the, um, the Fry uh, webpage will, will show you. But um, working with Alison Bremner um, on that was, you know, for those two exhibitions uh, was a really fantastic experience because I got to work um, with the Fry for almost a year um, working on these two um, exhibitions, which um, debuted back to back. And, you know, with Stormy, we were really looking at layers of history and true to the title, you know, a palimpsest is before there was readily available paper, you know, you'd have to clear it off, clear off your piece of papyrus. And then whatever was there before was still a little bit imprinted onto that surface. And so then you would put the next thing on and then wipe that away. And that would leave a little bit of a remnant and it just kept on building and building. And so even though you could, in theory, wipe it clean, there was still evidence of what was there before. And so we used that um, as a guiding thought through uh, Stormy's exhibition to really think about how all the different layers of people, the layers of beings that have imprinted on what we now call Seattle. And so um, looking, and then we looked directly to the archives. Um, through the WA, WPA um, project to document how many buildings were in Seattle. We found this place that was now housing the casino. And um, this was a place that was a refuge for um, LGBTQ um, folks who, who were displaced, who were um, shunned from their communities. And also because it was illegal, you know, in the 1930s, this was a, a literally a safe place for them, um, not just in the metaphorical safe space that we try to create now um, for people to feel welcome. But that was a really um, challenging exhibition to work on because she is primarily a spoken word artist and a poet. And so how do we work to move that into something tangible that could stand alone while she wasn't in the room um, speaking her art. And so that one, um, at one point she said that she wanted to make it look like um, a book had exploded onto the walls. And so um, the exhibition designers there uh, came up with the idea of putting her um, blocks of text into an antique yellow color to make it look like it was part of an older text, an older book. And so that's um, visually how we started to delineate the space. And because she's also talking about migration and terraforming and the way that not only the people change, but the land changes. Um, <clears throat> she also wanted to recreate the journey of her grandmother and her grand aunt who were taken by their father uh, when they were very young children and brought to Seattle and never made it back to Alaska. You know, they lived their lives here in Seattle. And so she was thinking of, um, with this deep empathetic lens towards her family of what would kids need to feel safe? And so we we recreated that journey. Um, you know, Stormy is Sukpiak, an African-American, and we created, um, a little packs for them. And so we borrowed a kayak from a, a kayak company here in Seattle that makes them very traditional kayaks, even though they're not native themselves. And um, we borrowed a kayak and loaded it up with food and medicine and blankets and all the things that a native person would need to go on a journey. And so symbolically recreated that journey for her grandparents. And it was just really beautiful. And on the label, we mentioned that it was packed with things, but we didn't list what was inside. Because um, if she was there and she wanted to share um, with whoever was in the space what was inside of that kayak, uh, she could do that. But in that way, we made it um, known that there was something there, but we didn't make it all the way accessible to anybody that walked in. Um, when it came to Allison's exhibition, you know, she really wanted to challenge how um, there's this perception of Northwest Coast art, of Clinkett art specifically, and she wanted to challenge the stereotypes of what Clinkett art looks like. And she did it 
in a way uh, she did it by using like the most clinket methods possible <laughs> i mean she has worked really hard to um to achieve her level of precision in her form line in her form line aesthetic and she has just been um diligently working on this she trained with um the boxleys and um did this intensive apprenticeship to really work on the lines and the proportion, the placement, the spacing, everything about it, and is really well known now for her precision and her and her form line. And she used that to also challenge this idea that you brought up, Ryan, about um, natives being um, about uh, how we're not that there's this incompatibility with technology with natives. And so she's like, oh yeah, what about emojis? Boom, here's some clinket emojis. And then, you know, also really um, challenge this idea of how ubiquitous QR codes have become just in the digital space, but also um, appropriated that for um, her own ideas of how owls are messengers, you know, for clinket people, owls are not um, a necessarily a bad omen but really communicators. And so if the QR code is a communicator and so is an owl, she put them together in this way that just resonates so um, easily with folks who have a familiarity with digital um, media, with digital aesthetics. And so that was just a really um, fantastic example right there. Also, she wanted to think about how um, native culture um, specifically clinket culture has been subjugated through different laws. So if we think about the potlatch ban, um, ceremonial, um, the way that ceremonies of our Native American and Alaska Native people have been um, deemed illegal through this assimilationist project of the United States, um, how it has stifled our creativity when it comes to our outward, um, our outward materials. And so she was thinking of, of the, um, the way that we get inspiration from each other every two years at celebration. You know, we see somebody's fancy regalia upgrades on this side, and then we see somebody's um, headdress on this side, and we say, oh, I'm going to do that. And then two years later, we have two years to work on it and then reveal our new improved regalia. And she was wondering like, what would have happened if we didn't have to take our ceremonies underground. Um, for all those years, what hap what would happen to our creativity if we didn't have that chunk of time where we had to be careful about being caught just for being who we are? And so she really used that opportunity to bring forward this futuristic regalia um, that was playing on this idea of futurisms and um, what if we were just free to explore instead of being constrained by either um, stereotypes of us or our own internalized, um, I don't wanna say repression, but if we're just trying to hold on to what we have because it has been stripped so violently from us, uh, what would that have allowed in terms of our creativity as, as native artists, as native people? And so, um, it was from those two experiences. I was already working on Preston's exhibition with the Museum of Glasses. Um, I worked on that for four years. And um, it was an incredible experience, you know, to tell um, an iconic Clinkett story through this immersive exhibition. And knowing that Preston was putting so much of his own effort, um, you know, a lot of times artists are asked to create an exhibition and there's some funds or they want you to draw from existing work. He created brand new work for the majority of that exhibition. And it was just phenomenal to see how him and his studio um, had so much effort of and of themselves, their energy put into this. And not just because um, Preston and I are both Clinkit and so being very careful and deliberate in our steps to create our version of this story while pulling from multiple versions of the story. You know, uh, Raven is a popular guy. And so he's uh, all over the Northwest coast. 
dozens and dozens of Raven stories and many versions of the Raven in the Box of Daylight story. And so we really tried to balance it by um, drawing on stories that were told by um, elders, by living and passed on elders. Also, um, you know, when you mentioned um, interior Salish, uh, Ryan, we also drew from stories from interior Clinket as well as coastal Clinket. And so seeing the variety and the details, I mean, cause they, the stories are basically all the same, you know, it's dark and then it's light and Raven is responsible um, for his shenanigans in the middle that bring us the light in the world. Um, but the details that are embedded in each of the stories that show the particularities of the landscape, of the tides, of the different animals, you know, it was just really beautiful to take such a close look at those and to weave them together into a story that we are telling and contributing to the world. And so um, with, with Preston's, you know, it started off at the Museum of Glass and then it traveled to Wichita which then promptly had to shut down because of COVID. So it stayed in Wichita for a while longer. And then it will be, it's set to open um, in January, at the end of January at the National Museum of the American Indian in DC where it will um, stay for a year. So um, that's just an overview of some of the projects that I have worked on. Uh, I have one in the hopper uh, working with Shosho Esquiro who is um, a fashion designer, textile artist, multimedia artist um, from the Yukon. And so um, we'll be, she'll be having her first solo exhibition at the Bill Reed Gallery uh, in Vancouver in September. And I really hope that the border is open and I can go to the opening, <laughs> but um, that's what I'm working on right now. Well, that's really wonderful to hear. And I'm so glad to hear that um, the Singletary show is going to be at NMAI for an entire year because I really want to see it again. It just takes, I'm sure it will look slightly different in that um, space than it did in Tacoma. And, and I feel like it just deserves so much time and it's so, and so much thought. And you, it's just really um, engaging in a, a really multi sensory way, which is so rare for and exhibition. Um, and I, I have many questions and I, I wanna open this up to questions for you all as well. Many of the questions I'm bringing today were suggested by students in a class that I had last quarter who were uh, involved in these conversations. And one of the things they were talking about was, you know, how as curators or as artists who are participating in exhibits, do we get at those other senses for the visitor to the museum? And sometimes that's about, you know, we were looking at, some of the um, performative aspects of Northwest Coast art, you know, and I think in Allison's show, you know, she had her the, the beautiful bridal regalia she had created. And even though it was they were on mannequins, it made you think about that sense of being within a sort of a, a space of, of action and, and of emotion. And um, so I was just wondering if there were any things that either of you wanted to talk about in terms of, um, trying to engage visitors in ways beyond the visual. Did you want to take that first, Ryan? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, well, one way is definitely auditory, you know, and so in um, all three of the exhibitions uh, that I mentioned today, we used um, sound. Um, in Preston's, it was ambient. And so as you walk through um, the exhibition, because it had a very linear um, narrative flow that we wanted the visitors to follow. And so at different points, you would just hear the language or you would hear a raven cawing and um, you would just, just hear it. And so it wasn't like you had to stop and listen. It was just kind of washing over people as they made their way through. In um, Stormy, she wanted the first um, image and the first sound that people heard to be the Lushootsi language because she's also a visitor. You know, she's lived here, this, she's third generation Seattle resident, but, um, you know, she's not from here. Her family's not from here. And so um, she wanted to honor um, our Salish 
hosts by making everybody that came to our exhibition encounter Le Chutzit first. And so um, there was a story that um, a friend of mine, uh, Noel Purser Rosario, who is Suquamish, um, she wrote a story and told it. And so then as you came into the exhibition, there was a, a gigantic photo of downtown Seattle before it got filled um, by people like Mr. Fry, um, you know? And so um, there was the waterfront and canoes and merchants, and then the story in La Seed, so that way people would hear it. And for many folks, that was the first time they'd ever heard La Seed um, or seen it, you know, in, in text, seeing the Fontuzzi. And so then in Allison's, there was also um, an audio dome and so a sound dome. So when you stood underneath it, you could hear the Clinket language. Um, and it was a page from the Clinket dictionary being read by, um, by Paul Marx III. And so then the very Clinket brogue, you know, and timber to his voice. So if you've been to Juno, it sounds very familiar. And he would read the words. He wouldn't read the English part, just the Clinket part. And and that for many folks, that was the first time that they had heard it. Ryan? Um, I'm not sure that I've had that much experience bringing in a lot of uh, different sensory experiences. Um, I have done some shows that have um, projects that have sound elements in them, but I, I think the closest but not quite answer I have is that I do think a lot about how people view things um, and that there's different ways to experience or there's, there's different physical experiences of art. And so I'm careful to never have everything be in the same format. Like even with the glass show where everything we're just is just all glass, I still wanted to break that then pedestal relationship. So there's still work on the walls and in which case that's a pick a piece by Nicholas Gallinan, where it's, I've mounted it at head height so that you see it's a mirror that's etched. Um, and so you see yourself confronted in the language. And uh, similar to like with the chair sitting there, there's this expectation of like chairs that you could sit in. It is put in awkward position so you can't, but this idea that there's, um, that the work implies different ways to look at it um, and to interact with it, I think is, um, an approach that helps break the traditional like object viewer relationship and make people feel more like in the space with, with these works. Well, and one of the things that strikes me about so many of the pieces that you have done that are interactive, right? Is that people are, you know, they're painting on the ground or they're using the coyote bone crayons that you've made or they get to interact in that way. And, and for those, pieces that you that you created as the artist in charge of that experience people really got to you know use their whole bodies to be a part of the art experience which is pretty rare in the museum setting so those I always find you know incredibly um both challenging sometimes scary for viewers who don't they're not ready to like draw on the walls you know in the museum um but those I find also are one of those ways where we hopefully have a chance to to push viewers and their expectations a little bit. Miranda, you? I'll, I'll say that I, um, when when we were coming up with the exhibition ideas and plans for, for Preston's work, you know, we really relied heavily on um, Juniper from the, um, the group Juniper Zoe. And so Juniper is the one that came up with the projections that you see throughout the exhibition. And um, we kind of went on this tangent that the Museum of Glass didn't quite appreciate because we were like, okay, we want him to go into the clan house. Clan houses are usually faced in cedar. So we want cedar inside the clan house so people can smell the cedar. And they said, well, what about the people that are allergic to cedar? And we said, uh, oh yeah, uh, what about them? <laughs> <laughs> and then we said, well, there's a fire. And so then he was gonna make this slumped glass 
fire with a projection of a fire coming down and we're going to have a mirrored wall. And then I wanted to put it on a pedestal and then actually have a heater in the bottom of the pedestal so that it kicked out heat. And they said, well, what about the climate control? And I was like, it's glass. It's fine. It'll be fine. You have a glass museum. <laughs> Don't you have a hot shop here? Don't you deal with molten lava in that room over there? But you know, there was, we had all these wild ideas and the constraints of the museum really made us pull back. But I could, I, I still want him to do like a, a fire with the actual heater underneath it in some space like Site Santa Fe um, or somewhere like that where they would just let him go crazy. I love that. That's so great. And I think it brings me to one of my other questions, which is what, um, you know, I worked as a curator inside museums and I haven't done too much work in other institutions besides the one that I work in. And so I was wondering if either of you had sort of observations on the, that relationship, both the positives and maybe the difficulties of when you are the invited or you know, hired, contracted curator for an um, exhibition. Um, it's, it's different in a lot of spaces, but um, I think one thing that for me is always kind of awkward about that is that, you know, I'm not a professional curator, I'm a professional artist. Um, and so in, many of the exhibition, the few exhibitions I've curated, um, almost all, um, I'm paired with someone who is a professional who, who lends credibility um, and is sometimes like simultaneously named whether or not they actually participated in the planning of the exhibition. Um, so that's been a, a, a conflict for me that I think it has been a conflict for a lot of Native curators is they want you know, an institution may want to contract you to be on an exhibition, but oftentimes it's with someone else's name who attached attached to it. Um, and yeah, so that can be awkward, uh, especially especially when they don't act, like in one case, the person didn't actually participate at all but still is named on all of the materials or didn't participate in the creation, but only the installation and is still named sometimes first in these. So I think that that kind of um, institutional versus guest for curation um, could definitely use some, some work on making sure that that's always a uh, appropriate and respectful pairing. Um, my last project was interesting because I, you know, I was curating, but I worked with a committee. And so is the first time I'd really been in a position where like a group of people could be like, no, we don't like your ideas and we're not going to do it. Um, but luckily that didn't happen. They were all, they all loved the artists and it went great, but it was definitely a different kind of power position where a group of non-arts people could also um, decline the, uh, my, my recommendations. So that was an interesting position as well. The guest has some, definitely has some uh, leeway that um, the staff doesn't, you know, and so if, if the guest sees um, points of either inequity or um, some other types of buffoonery, they can call it out without having to worry about their job, right? So, and, and they don't have to stay there. And so they can come along and point out this, this needs to change, this needs to change and then be on their merry way. But what does that mean for the people who do have to work there? And um, does that create some kind of imbalance or some tension that is gonna be a fallout after this, the people on the upper management side being called out so directly, um, which can be, good and also cause tension. But also, you know, I, I've been thinking about this, about the, the ways that, especially in this moment of recognizing that Black Lives Matter, that um, there's this epidemic of missing and murdered Indigenous women, that there's this push for 
um, diversity, equity, inclusion across the cultural heritage sector, as well as academia, um, you know, really thinking about this question of equity, where are the jobs? And so it is fantastic that there are guest curators that are coming in and being able to lend voice and to really shine um, a light on artists that are in the early points of their career and to help make um, the work known of, of mid-career and established artists known to the wider arts community. But um, where are the jobs? You know, and so if we're really pushing for equity, if we're really pushing for inclusion and diversity of thought, then um, we need to hire folks full time. And so that puts, you know, the guest curator in this constant grind of having to hustle from job to job to job so they can earn a living. Um, and so if, if the museums um, as, as a field, if museums are really committed, committed to social justice in the way that we've heard about in the last year. Um, you know, some places have worked on this for longer, but, you know, it's really become um, performative in a way in the last year. And so um, if they're going to be serious about this, then I think the funding needs to go to permanent positions and not just for the outward facing person, you know, of the the curator of exhibitions, but also, you know, at all different levels and including the executive levels. Yeah, that's such an important point, Miranda, and particularly for those of us who work within institutions, whether it's like myself in, in the Burke or both of us as academics at the University of Washington to keep pushing, pushing and, and to help redefine what our institutions count as knowledge or count as the experience one needs? Does it have to be the piece of paper with the letters behind your name? It doesn't, it has, you know, has to do with all kinds of other expertise that you bring to that moment and to the job that, that needs that for sure. So that's definitely something that our institutions need to um, spend more time working on. Miranda, I wanted to give you a chance. You said you had some questions in mind for Ryan and I didn't wanna just run everybody over with my own questions. And of course, Ryan, if you have ones you wanted to bring out, that's great too. Yeah, and Ryan, you already started to ask, to, to touch on this when you um, mentioned that about, um, that you're not a professional curator, you're a professional artist. And so can you talk a little bit more about how you started getting, uh, how do you started blurring those lines? What are the benefits? What are the challenges there? Yeah, so um, I guess there's a, there was a little bit of an overlap on it. Like the first, I, I did ask to curate at an institution and was completely thoroughly ignored. But then a couple of years later, they came back and 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 talked to me about um, the In Red, Red Ink, which was my first um, curatorial project. Um, my the start of my interest was in um, I, I kept having a similar experience where someone would call me and they'd want to meet for coffee and they'd want to pick my brain for artists and ideas. And I had a particularly bad experience with that. I used to be very, very open and generous with it. And then I had a very negative experience and I thought, well, if, if people want to know the artists I'm interested in, maybe I should pursue curating because then I'm not just saying I love all these artists. I want to support their work. I want other people to know about these wonderful artists and then let another person make the decisions about which artists they bring forward. Um, I wanted to participate in more, that more hands-on. And so when I had the opportunity to, to try that, um, I really enjoyed it and, and, and jumped on it. And I, I look at it a lot as part of um, building community. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel the need to be a part of every exhibition. So it's not hard for me to exclude myself from the, the exhibition as a, as the curator. Um, and I really, I really enjoy exhibitions that have like thorough content and messaging and are more than just um, a 
survey or a surface level idea or sometimes a rich person's collection that they want a tax write off on and they think it's so great that they're sharing that with us. I really wanted more media exhibitions that um, show especially all the incredible work that contemporary Native artists are doing. And so I've basically been invested in creating projects for that like very deliberate purpose. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been talking with um, Nancy Michael quite a bit about this idea because she is advocating for more um, more training for art scholars, for Native art scholars, and for Native arts curators. And she's thinking specifically in arts uh, curatorship. And so that's been something that's been on my mind. And um, when we were talking about it last, you know, she she gave this amazing uh, presentation about, uh, it was part of the um, We Have Words for Art uh, writing symposium. And in there, when she was talking about how, not just this significant power sharing of getting folks into jobs in, in um, museums, but also like just doing the work, like actually doing the work. And so um, it's it's been, really interesting to hear different folks talk about how they get to do the work and how they get invited in or like you said you were um, denied the opportunity and then later on they came back and said oh hey yeah remember when <laughs> you wanted to do this or maybe they pretended they didn't know but um, or didn't remember and how people get the opportunity to do the work is a really interesting and always um, novel conversation because there's so many different pathways to get to the space, you know, besides just just the academic um, hoops that we have to jump through um, for folks that go the academic route. Well, these are, we're hitting on so many really big ideas. Um, and one of the things I was thinking about, and you're talking, Ryan, about, you know, bringing out a, all of the incredibly creative things in young emerging Native artists. Um, and I'm also watching moments across the city where there are both specific commissions for Indigenous artists, particularly ones with connections to the um, territories here or the cultural histories here. And additionally, there are other um, commissions that are open, you know, for everyone. They're, they're looking for an artist to make public artwork. Um, and I and I know that you've been very successful at some of those, Ryan, the um, Synecdoche, the giant mural in the Burke, and um, now antecedents in the public health building where these were, well, I don't know what the call for the public health building looked like, but uh, in the Burke, that was not a call for an indigenous artist to make something that had to do about uh, Salish histories or indigenous histories. That was really a call for someone to come in and pull together this institution, which is unbelievably diverse, right? We have all the problems and benefits of a natural history and culture museum where we have paleontology and mammalogy and the plants and fishes and archeology span and contemporary culture. Um, and I was wondering, Ryan, if you would mind, can I show the little less than two minute video of you talking about Synecdoche and then um, maybe we could talk about public art and it's, uh, Challenges? Sure, that's great. Okay, let me see if I can share my screen here. My name is Ryan Federson. I am a visual artist based in Tacoma, Washington, and I created Synecdoche for the Burke Museum. I'm inspired by indigenous traditions of communal practice. I believe in making works that can be touched, that are for community and about community. Synecdoche was inspired by seeing the connections and continuum of visual motifs throughout history, culture, and contemporary pop culture in the Pacific Northwest. The glyphs in Synecdoche are drawn from a lot of sources. 
I met with a representative from almost every area of the Search. There's a variety of references to favorite specimens, to research, all placed in a way that connects them to other areas of the museum. Knowing that the building was going to have a crisp and industrial, minimal aesthetic, I felt that the black and white silhouettes and pops of color would complement the architecture of the building. Synecdoches are a figurative expression wherein a larger idea is substituted with a specific. And so in this piece, I'm encouraging people to look for synecdoches both in the piece as well as in the museum to think about how different symbols can represent larger ideas and how those larger ideas interact with each other. There are numerous references and things to discover, but that's left for the viewer. Well, I, I really was so excited when you got that commission and I was also had so much trepidation for you because we are this incredibly challenging institution um, and there are lots of things that bring us all together that we sort of think of as our burkiness uh, as we call it, but I thought that it would be really challenging for someone to come in and and sort of figure out some of that and then figure out how to visualize that and to, I love in the video where you're talking about being really in tune with the architecture and the style um, and that look of the building. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that process, particularly the work going through the collections because the programs that I run, right? Artists come in all the time and work with our cultural collections, but I haven't seen this kind of um, moment where people get to go into all the other collections and get inspired as an artist. Uh, and then we could move into sort of larger conversations about public artworks that respond to their particular sites. Um, well, as you know, I was one of your visiting artists and that did inspire um, part of the structuring of this piece. So this was a call where um, it started with a general application and then it required a proposal with the interview, which is, um, you know, not always how things are done and can make things very challenging for doing site specific work because you don't have that time to start with the research. And so instead I proposed a research project that talked about some of the aesthetics of the space um, and the essential plan, but then I proposed the work to come later of doing this research and bringing in um, elements from the, from the different areas throughout the, throughout the building. And it was, it was actually, it was so much fun to learn about all the different things people were doing. And everywhere I went, I was like, what's your favorite specimen? And I saw some really amazing and really disgusting things, uh, especially with like the fish. Um, and getting to have that kind of experience throughout the Burke, I think both really informed the piece. It became different than I expected it to be. Um, but uh, it, was a, it, was a very, it was a very positive ex experience. And I think that uh, I'm really excited that you guys like it and that it integrates so well. I, I, I did hear that there was a lot of trepidation with um, like the conflict of expectations and aesthetic. Like maybe this wasn't the um, way, either the style of work that the Burke was initially expecting or the community was expecting. Um, and also maybe not what they were expecting from a native artist. Um, but I think that, you know, breaking those expectations is an opportunity to grow and innovate and get to different places. And I was very excited to be able to do that with you guys. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you put your finger on it. I think there were a lot of sort of visionings of what this big, uh, for a while it was called the wall of Washington, what it's going to look like. Um, and there's no reason for me to describe what people were visioning and this wasn't it. And this is so incredibly successful. It's so intriguing um, to people who are coming to the Burke and looking closely, right? Many people come to the Burke because they're really interested in seeing the real original thing. And they see this great, all these different collections are looking really closely. And then you turn to the wall 
and you follow these visual icons and through their transformations and everybody can bring different look for different things that they may have recognized in the museum. It's so, it, for me, it, it hits a lot of the things that public artworks should do. Um, and so I was, you know, I, I have that feeling about this piece. I also feel that the Guests of the Great River, the big bronze canoe paddle installation that's outside now by Tony Johnson and Adam McIsaac also hits some of those really important sort of interactive, um, public intriguing, uh, ways that public art should do. And Miranda, I was struck by the way you did that, even though it's not that um, the Singletary exhibit is not a public artwork like that, you still have that sense of really engaging um, and people's flow through or visual interaction with a piece that I feel like is such an important part of a public artwork. And then talking about um, working at the Fry, uh, and thinking about the site-specific history of that institution, you know, and what does that name Fry mean in terms of Seattle's development? What does it mean in terms of um, what the visitor might expect, you know, and that has changed a lot over the years at the Fry Museum, and I think uh, the exhibits you did have contributed a lot to that. So anyway, I just wanted to open it up a little bit more to this idea of what the challenges and also what the great things that public artworks can do uh, in our city. You asking me what the artworks can do in the city? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just, I love some of the interventions that I think your curatorial work has done. And then I was wondering if you, as someone who works with uh, a lot of different kinds of artwork and um, thinking about these knowledge systems and pushing back on maybe what um, the average visitor or the average citizen in our city ha uh, has in mind when we uh, have these indigenous artworks out in the public. That's something I really appreciate about Seattle and living um, in the Pacific Northwest is just the way that native art is very visible um, and that it, you don't have to go too far before you encounter something that whether you recognize exactly where it's from most people recognize it as native um and i think that that is it goes a long way to um humanizing natives and bringing attention to i mean there's there's a whole segment of of society that still thinks that natives have have become extinct, um, that we live in a, this ahistorical frozen bubble. And that we also, um, like, like Ryan was saying about the stereotypes, you know, the stereotypes of being able to challenge those either through materials, through the placement, or through um, the content is, is really exciting to see, especially the way that um, Native artists are, are using um, all the materials that are available now, including film, um, photography. You know, you mentioned um, Cara Romero, who is just a phenomenal uh, photographer and, and making these very, um, it's, there's no mistake that it's a contemporary photograph, right? But using elements from um, very customary parts of her community. And so um, I also love her, her image of, um, is it called Trickster Tales, where it's the, the women outside the bar and he sees one of them with a little tail coming out and uh, really flipping that idea of who's the trickster and um, what kind of, of adventures they would be getting into now. And you know what kind of havoc has <laughs> the tricksters played on the world right now and what are they gonna do tomorrow? And so um, I think in that way, without naming um, all the different projects, you know, I really like that unconventional placement of art and how it challenges these ideas, like this very um, native, native um, ethos and practice behind what drove your antecedents 
um, piece, Ryan, you know, to be the welcoming image of the, um, is it the public health, the population health building. And I can't wait to see that in person because um, you've drawn together so many different ways that it could connect to the audience in, in this being just people who work in the building or who are there for appointments, you know, and that it resonates with them on this visceral level of maybe they're there to, they just got some bad news or maybe they're there in anticipation of bad news, but when they see this imagery right there, welcoming them in and for the researchers too, to really think about how art can play a role in um, how they think about data. Um, I keep getting pulled into, my heart is with, with art, with native art. Uh, I keep getting pulled into these conversations about indigenous data and um, makes sense because I'm an information scientist. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, um, this idea that there is something different going on in Native communities around data, and to highlight that through art is just brilliant, brilliant. I don't know even know if that answered your question. I'm just kind of rambling right now, Katie. That's but, all right. Um, this is this is what this you know session is for. I love that they're conversations, right? They're not interviews. They're not you know we're not holding forth on a particular topic. I just think they're conversations. And um, I want to remind the audience that we would like to have a conversation with you as well. And I know that uh, we have other curators in our, in our audience um, and uh, other great museum supporters and attendees. So please um, feel free to, to post your questions and we would like to get to those for sure. Um, Ryan, are there topics that you want to cover? I have, you know, way more questions from my students, but I also want to make sure that, you know, we hit things that are of interest to everyone. Uh, yeah, I just want to make a quick response to the public art conversation and then yes. throw a question to Miranda. And so, um, you know, public art does come with challenges, but it's incredibly rewarding. Historically, public art has been used by systems of power, by governments and religions to create um, the cultural dialogue about who and who we are and why the do, we do the things we do. And right now, particularly, we're in a time where we can access more of that conversation in space. And so I highlight, like, it is a great way for artists to dialogue with community and society and bring our values and our ideas to the public forum. Um, if there are any Native artists listening, um, the uh, Arts Law, uh, the Washington State Arts Commission currently has its roster open. That is how I made the work antecedent for the Population Health Building. I was actually selected from this roster and um, offered this project without interview or application because I'd filled out this earlier application, which is now open. We also have, there is a, a mentorship program that I'm participating in where I am offering 30 minute um, mentoring sessions to give advice to first time applicants on how to present, put their best foot forward in their portfolio materials. So if you're at all interested in pursuing public art, you should look at um, either my Instagram or you can look at the Arts Wa and learn about how to get some mentorship and get on that list. That's a plug. Um. <laughs> I think you answered the question that just came up in the chat. I don't know if you even saw it, but the question was, as a young artist and curator, what is your advice for someone just starting in the field? So those are two really wonderful pieces of advice. Um, yeah, roster, rosters are great. Um, they're a great way to get your name and work out there. And even if you don't automatically get projects from them, you get seen a lot and you might get projects from being rejected from them, which is how I got my first project was being rejected over and over again from an earlier roster. And then somebody was like, I'm going to work with this person. Um, so I think that that's, um, it's, it's a great way to get, get, your, get your name in front of the right people. Uh, and the question I wanted to ask Miranda was, I wanted to know if you wanted to speak on some of the research angle of your curatorial projects. Thank you. Um, you know, there, there was significant research that went into all of them. Um, I mentioned going into the archives uh, for Stormy's exhibition that was um, in Bellevue um, at one of the regional places. And um, 
that was one of those folk where places where you have to like leave all of your materials in a in a locker and then go in for a set amount of time and look through with gloves and only a pencil, no pens. And um, that's where I found the photos for for that. And then with Preston's, you know, we went into um, recorded, um, transcribed, and then translated versions of the story because both Preston and I are not. Um, Clinket speakers. And so we relied really heavily on the language warriors um, for all of their work there to help build up these different layers of the exhibition. And in my research side, um, because um, this idea of what is Indigenous curation is been coming up a lot. And so um, I'm now fortunate to, to lead a research team. Um, some of the folks are here listening, um, Brandon Castle, Glennis Echavari, and just now we included uh, Tessa Campbell, who's in the PhD program at the in the iSchool, but also the former curator of the um, Keebel Center up in Tulalip. And so together we're really looking at this question of what is Indigenous curation? What makes it different? You know, it's a lot of folks, there's this consensus that there's a difference, but what is that difference? And so um, through interviews, through a survey um, and looking at the academic literature, we're really trying to put a, a stake, if I can follow in the footsteps of the great Jolene Rickard, um, you know, to draw a line in the sand and say, this is indigenous curation over here. And this is part of the practice that goes into this. And so far it's been really exciting to see um, give you a little spoiler, a little tea spoiler of our results and our findings is that it, and it's not a surprise to most people, it's, it's a spectrum, you know, and so we're looking at um, tribal curators who are working in their own home community, all the way to folks who are working at the, the national and the federal level. And so those experiences um, are just so varied, but there are commonalities there that really reflect um, a deep relationality with not just the people that they work with, but um, also the the ideas that they find themselves um, caring for. These are wonderful, and um, I'm seeing parts of the question and answer here that are um, we've been that are really enjoying our conversation about public art and how that. Um, moves the expectations of visitors or viewers or citizens of the city forward. Um, and there's a question wondering if we have any visions or hopes or thoughts on what the role of monuments is going to be moving forward within our various states. I would instruct everybody to watch this educational uh, series called Rutherford Falls. <laughs> Excellent. Good. Good. Yes. <laughs> Treat yourself to some Rutherford Falls and see how they're dealing with monuments and, and native cultural centers. <laughs> well, we've certainly had some conversations about that in the public in Seattle, right? We have, um, you know, who's getting the new public commissions? Of course, that's part of it. Um, but also, what do we do with things like um, polls that have been put up? There was a discussion in Tacoma last week of uh, one of the polls in Tacoma, which has a sort of questionable history uh, and whether those things should remain standing on Salish territory, of which of course they're not, um, you know, the original type of public art here. Uh, and, and so I think there's a lot of conversations, hard and full of potential that are coming up. And I don't know if, Ryan, if you have any thoughts on, on those are sort of on the public art questions going forward. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no one answer, but I think that the answer is not to stop evaluating. We have to keep continuously evaluating our past and our values and what we want to represent our histories. And like one thing, so the, actually the piece 900 Horses, um, when I do longer talk, inspired by a monument to that massacre, which was this incredibly racist, braggy, terrible um, statue. 
of the kind of like the end of the trail in India and there refers to Native people as an outbreak and justifies the violence. It's really, it's really quite horrible. And so this making 900 horses was a about, about um, contrasting a monument with memorial and what it means to, to honor lives lost rather than celebrate uh, violence. And, but also another thing that came up during that is that, you know, it was erected in 1946. And this is a case with a lot of these historic monuments that are like erasing history if you take them down, is that they weren't made in the, in the time that they're representing. They were often made during times when people were having a backlash. So in this case, this monument came up during a time when Nazism was rising in America as a response to our participating in World War II. A lot of, um, uh, a lot of the Civil War statues celebrating the Confederacy were made during the 90s when there was this massive resurgence of white supremacy being fueled by um, recruitment online and, and the internet helping them facilitate their growth. And so we do need to question these, these instances. And sometimes the answer is take them down. Sometimes the answer is provide interpretive context. Um, I've always had a joke response, which was to go to these these monuments made in the 90 to Civil War heroes and put monuments of like 90 celebrities to be like, this is the time this was made. <laughs> this is the actual history of this moment. This other thing is this imaginary celebration of like, it's, it's, it's different. Um, but I think we should continue to question. And I think that we should also like look at how, look at our own legacy and how we're, what we're making now and how we're informing um, long-term conversation from that. Um, and just to, you know, use as encouragement to be responsible and thoughtful in the culture that we produce for the future. I was gonna plus one everything she said. <laughs> that was an incredible answer. And I really like the idea of showing what was contemporary about the time that it was made. That is a great idea. And it also brings up this really hard question of what do we do with the pieces, you know, so if it is time to tear them down, or if it's time to move them to their own location, you know, I was just having this um, conversation with Anya Montiel the other day, um, when we were talking about contentious art, and how do you draw those into a conversation to point out the points of contention. So then is this is this something that you should have an exhibition about with tons of labels and didactic text saying this is terrible because, but then you're still giving it space, right? And you're still taking up that time and energy and giving it a platform. But if you don't address it, then you let people make up their own story and you let them um, come up with their own ideas um, instead of taking a deeper look at why something might be totally offensive now in this frame um, versus when it was made, even though it was probably really offensive when it was made, if it was made in the 90s. Um, but how do we address that? You know, I, I'm not quite sure, but I am really on board with this idea that it, it's not just one answer. It's going to have to take a lot of thought and it's not going to be just one. It, it probably won't just be one way. Absolutely. And, you know, as you and I and all of us really people who are involved in being interested in those histories, you know, what are the histories at that moment? What are the histories at that moment that are responding to histories that have come before? And, you know, always trying to provide the context, right? Everything is it. Well, it depends on what is the context for that, that moment. Um, I wanted to ask what uh, a question that one of the students put forward. Um, as we're talking about these future visions, right? We're talking about what, what's the next thing for monuments? What's the next thing for public art in the city? Um, and so um, Serena Wong asked, what kind of growth would you like to see in the connection that museums make between artists and audience? And so I thought both of you might have thoughts of that either from the curatorial or artist or both sides.
creating the, can, can you say that again about the, um, yeah. the question is what kind of growth would you like to see in the connections that museums make between artist and audience? Sometimes I feel like there's this um, like protective cocoon that museums put around the artists and then like the artist gets put on the pedestal as well. And so they get removed from the audience that they're they just seen as inaccessible. And outside of the artist talks and workshops, you know, it seems like you have to be engaged in those in those spaces to be able to engage with the artists. And I think that right now, uh, social media has just played such a pivotal role in allowing the artists to directly connect with the audience, to directly connect with buyers and also with funders of future projects. And it's becoming more and more common to see um, social media being the vehicle by which these connections are made and then strengthened afterwards too. Um, sorry, there's a <laughs> there's an airplane going over somewhere right now, but um, also I think some of that is up to the artists too, you know. And so when Stormy had her exhibition at the Fry, she would just go wander around through the Fry, you know. And then all of a sudden, people would recognize that that was her because we did have a portrait of her um, in drag in in the exhibition and so then once they would make that connection or they would hear her voice because we did have a listening room with really cozy chairs and a dim dim lighting you know so you could listen to her poetry and if they heard her voice they would make that connection and it just allowed for a really casual interaction but i think right now um facilitating that casual interaction is is something that artists are doing on their own through social media. Well, certainly, Ryan, your social media is very active. And <laughs> no, it's not. Well, well maybe not right. your social media, but I see you, your stuff on Twitter, maybe through Arts Law or anyway, it's a very easy place for me to find that it looks like you're being very busy. So, <laughs> um, but also you have had so many of those um, short term residencies where you're really talking to people who are engaging with the artworks that you're creating. Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. Oh, sorry, I shouldn't be defensive. Like, I'm, I'm not good at Instagram. I'm very bad. I need to be much, much better to, <laughs> to, to cultivate an audience. It's because I'm old. Um, but uh, I do, I do love <laughs> residencies. And I mean, part of my practice is, um, you know, there are some things that I make, make for myself or make for family. I have a craft practice that's separate. But my art practice is about making work for, for people and communities. And so, um, that site specificity and the changing of the work and the way that I'm like addressing different problems and audiences is a really big part of my practice. Um, so that kind of like continuous investment is important. So I guess this kind of slants maybe my answer to the first question is like, what is needed for more growth? And I think, I think the acknowledgement the artists are not commodity, um, commodity creators that it's not the object that is that artists make where the value is. It's the whole process and experience and that artists, that being an artist is a role um, needs to be recognized by museums. Cause I think that that's, I think that's what people wanna see more of. And I know that's what I wanna see more of. I don't just wanna go to a museum and look at a pretty object that, you know, I could never afford. I want to engage with ideas and projects and things that maybe are completely impractical to, for anyone to have in their home. And so that means that museums need to pay for those to happen. They need to fund artists. They need to fund projects, new projects. They need to understand the value of what's being created. I mean, I was recently asked to do a project in uh, the South this really big fancy museum. They had a Wame Quenza. I mean, those things are millions of dollars. And they wanted a massive like thousand square foot installation. And the budget I gave them, I felt was very, very reasonable. They were just like, that's like the budget for the whole show. They expected immersive installation work for in the like thousand dollars. 
which is insane, that expectation. The museums are not used to having to pay people to show their work, but that whole idea needs to be, needs to change. And they need to see like artists work is what people are coming to the museums to see. They need to be treated as um, that, that, that labor has, has value and not just the thing that's made from the labor that has a value. I, I cannot agree with you more. I think it's such an important change for institutions. I know in Canada, there are different rules around when you have to pay artists. I think that those need to be implemented in the States. You know, we need to pay artists, even if their pieces are in our collection, when we re-exhibit them each time, we need to pay a fee. Um, we're using them for promotional, museum promotional pieces. Those need, fees need to be paid for those. You know, as you say, it's not the one time moment of purchasing. And I also believe very highly in purchasing as much as you can, anytime you can. Um, so sorry, that's my soapbox, but I really appreciate you bringing it up. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left and I just wanted to throw to both of you, um, what's next? What are you most excited about that's coming up on the horizon? Well, I already mentioned um, the show shows exhibition that is uh, September 21st and 22nd is the opening dates for that at the Bill Reed Gallery in uh, lovely downtown uh, Vancouver, BC. Um, the catalog will come out um, hopefully about a month later. We want to have um, installation images that are included in that. And so um, that That'll be coming up. Preston, Preston's exhibition will be opening hopefully at the end of January um, at NMAI in DC. But also, you know, I'm just really um, excited about this research project um, that I get to work on as part of my job here um, at UW and to see how it can um, contribute to, to understanding the space and the all of the many beautiful um, gifts that Indigenous curators bring to the spaces that they work in and how um, those can be seen. Um, Jim Enote, who is my clan uncle um, in Zuni Pueblo, he said that he thinks that um, Indigenous curation is a higher order of curation and really seeing it as there's this ethical responsibility that um, Native people are bringing to the work that is one of the standards that he sees as um, going across the work of many different um, Indigenous curators and museum professionals to really not just care for objects, but also care for people. And so I'm just really excited to start writing about that, um, which will be a big part of um, what I'm doing this summer. Ryan? Um, I'm currently working a lot on public art projects. So what's next for me is I'm working on an intervention for a dry brutalist 1990s uh, water wall in Tacoma, which is a 200 by, I think it's like 200 feet by 30 feet of just cement. Um, and so I'm currently working on a intervention with that space that is installing in June. Um, so that and June and July and so that'll be completed this summer. I am also doing a uh, public art project with the Portland Airport, which is a, a major new wing of their um, They're putting in a new concourse and I'm the, the artist for that concourse I'm kind of doing a variety of pieces that kind of go through that space. Um, that is in uh, fabrication currently. And the concourse is slated to open this fall. So those are two really exciting projects for me. Um, I'm also working on a handful of other public art projects, but um, curatorially, I'm currently not working on any projects with anyone. Um, I, I did start before the pandemic, a international low res uh, master's in curatorial practice from a university in Bergen, which is a uh, practice-based program on uh, where you, each of the students from, it's all an international program, they work on their independent projects and do seminars together. And so I do have a curatorial project for that that's currently placed on hold while 
um, travel is uh, difficult, but um, soon I'll be kind of renewing that project and kind of doing a, my, actually my first totally self-initiated curatorial project. So I'm really excited about that. Those are wonderful. I cannot wait to see those installations. Um, they're gonna be excellent. And um, I just appreciate both of you spending so much of your time with us this evening. Um, I also appreciate that this will be recorded and I know that lots of people have come to the um, recordings of these and enjoyed them later, <laughs> particularly during our Zoom world where sometimes you're just done at the end of the day and sometimes you're excited to, to go back and look at these. So I really appreciate your time um, and I look forward to seeing what's coming along for both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, everyone have a good evening. And thank you very much.